Okay, we'll call to order the uh, subcommittee on communications and technology and the new Moog synthesizer that we've uh, lined up here. It's called surround sound. It is. Perhaps our audio engineers can get rid of the echo effect. Ah. Good morning. I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses today for clearing their schedules to come before our uh, subcommittee on communications and technology uh, to discuss the Obama administration's proposal to transfer to another entity oversight of the domain name system. I read all of your testimony. I appreciate your counsel, and I especially uh, appreciate the thoughtful scenarios and stress tests noted in Mr. Del Bianco's testimony. Those are precisely the kinds of issues that certainly get our attention. I cannot overstate the importance of freedom of the Internet from government control, nor can I overstate the threat from foreign governments who seek to control, tax, censor, and otherwise impose their own agendas on the Internet. That's why the House has unanimously passed both a resolution and legislation that affirm our policy that the United States should promote a global Internet free from government control. And I do hope the United States Senate will take up our latest measure with all due haste. Obviously, the administration's proposal has sparked furious debate and brought together in opposition some interesting former combatants ranging from Karl Rove to Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich. I called today's hearing to get answers to exactly what the Obama administration is proposing and what it is not. Are the goals of security, stability, resilience, and freedom of the Internet compatible with a multi-stakeholder managed domain name system? The multi-stakeholder model is a key part of the success of the Internet, with engineers, academics, public interest groups, and users collaborating in a bottom-up, not government-down approach. The decentralized management structure provides the flexibility to evolve and disperses the risks posed by bad actors. However, once NTIA gives up its current role, who will fill the void? What assurance do Internet users have that such a change will not lead to foreign government mischief? If things do go astray, is there a path back for NTIA? The role that NTIA performs, though somewhat ministerial, has served as an important backstop. While I am heartened to see the criteria that NTIA set forth for any acceptable proposal included a prohibition on government-led or governmental organi organization taking control, I do remain concerned about how to prevent such a takeover in the future. What safeguards would be in place? We cannot allow institutions such as the United Nations or the International Telecommunications Union to insert themselves into the functioning of the domain name system now or at as part of any successor solution. Make no mistake, threats to the openness and freedom of the Internet are real. Some authoritarian leaders, such as Vladimir Putin, have explicitly announced their desire to gain control of the Internet. In fact, just a year and a half ago, at the World Conference on International Telecommunications in Dubai, a group of nations attempted to use a treaty on telephone networks and services as a backdoor to impose policies that could have thwarted the robust and open nature of the Internet. I'm sure the administration understands why we're so concerned about any proposed changes to how the Internet's governed. We need details on how the process will work and the criteria for evaluating the proposals. Mr. Shimkus and Mrs. Blackburn have a bill they recently introduced, H.R. 4342, which I believe has been distributed to everyone here, that would have the GAO study the proposals and present a nonpartisan evaluation. This is a prudent idea and one we will move forward on very soon. Any plan must protect all participants in the Internet ecosystem and demonstrate the successor's technical ability to manage the IANA functions. If there are not sufficient safeguards in place to prevent foreign government intrusion, then this concept should go no further. Even with these guarantees, I remain concerned about the opportunities for abuse. When it comes to the core principles that NTIA and the State Department have put forward, I urge them to follow the admonition of Margaret Thatcher and, quote, don't go wobbly, quote. There's no putting this genie back in the bottle once the transition begins. So we're holding this hearing because far too much is at stake for any uncertainty or ambiguity as to our path forward. A little less than a year ago, the world was watching as we deliberated H.R. 1580, our unanimously passed bill supporting the multi-stakeholder process. The world, including those deeply concerned about government control of the Internet, is watching again today. 
This is the administration's opportunity to make its case and answer our questions. Prove to us that you will conduct this proposed process in a way that leaves no room for error and that will protect the free and open Internet we have all come to expect and rely upon. With that, I would yield to the Vice Chair of the Committee, Mr. Latta. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for our witness for testifying today. As the Chairman said, the Internet has developed into a robust and competitive frontier for free enterprise, innovation, job creation, and economic growth and prosperity. In our own democratic government, it serves as a tool for citizens to exercise their fundamental freedoms, and for those around the world, the Internet enables the exercise of basic human rights as well as political advancement and reform. The preser preservation of the Internet's openness and freedom is and must continue to be non-negotiable. As the NTIA prepares to relinquish its contractual oversight of IANA and with functions of ICANN, any new oversight proposals that threaten to diminish the existing multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance must be rejected. Not doing so will jeopardize the economic prosperity we have achieved throughout the United States and the world and may curtail the basic freedoms and human rights of millions, if not billions. I support calls to engage in rigorous and careful congressional oversight of NTI's proposed transition of this contract to ensure that no government or intergovernmental body takes control of domain name system responsibilities and that the Internet remains as free and open as it is today. And again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and before I recognize the gentlelady, the ranking uh, member from California, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put a uh, statement of support from the Internet Association. Uh, represents ma many of America's uh, great Internet successful uh, companies, including Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, Netflix, and Google, and statements from AT&T, Verizon, Cisco, and the United States Chamber of Commerce expressing support for a process to investigate a transition that precludes other governments from assuming the role uh, the U.S. currently plays. I have all of those. Without objection, they'll be entered into the record. And with that, I'll now turn to my friend and colleague from California, Ms. Eshoo, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, both for uh, having this hearing and for our uh, uh, important witnesses that are here today. Uh, this is a very important discussion that we're going to have, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, for more than two decades, uh, there's no question that the Internet uh, has flourished as a platform that enables the exchange of commerce, trade, uh, and information. Last year, the House passed legislation on a 413 to 0 vote, stating, quote, it is the policy of the United States to preserve and advance the successful multi-stakeholder model that governs the Internet, end of quote. Now we're hearing the criticisms and even rejection of this model, which has provided the underpinnings for innovation, openness, and economic prosperity around the world. I think it, uh, history can be instructive to us here. In 1998, the U.S. Department of Commerce outlined a plan that would phase out its policy oversight role within two years. While this transition obviously took longer than it should, uh, they operated more on government time than on real time, uh, uh, it's now time for the United States to finally walk the walk and demonstrate to the world that while the Internet was a product of America's genius, no government or intergovernmental organization should control its future. To ensure that the next two decades, and even beyond that, are just as successful, we need to think big about how we preserve the global Internet principles of openness, security, stability, and resiliency. In this context, NTIA's announcement last month to transition key Internet domain name functions to the global multi-stakeholder community is an important step in the evolution of the Internet. It's what people voted for, 413 to zip. That's what was embedded in that resolution. And that resolution uh, was uh, more than noticed by countries around the world because the United States of America was absolutely 1,000% united. The executive branch, the Senate, the House, um, all our representatives, there was no daylight between us. 
So I think it might be instructive to go back and see what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, members voted for. During the 2012 uh, World Conference on International uh, Telecommunications, uh, the WICIT in Dubai, we saw firsthand that there are nations around the globe who do not share our vision for maintaining the free flow of information across the internet. In practice, this has uh, manifested the f uh, uh, this has um, manifested itself in the blocking of popular social uh, media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, which are used daily by millions around the world um, uh, to share their ideas, their news, and their beliefs. Uh, I just uh, headed up a, uh, a resolution condemning Turkey uh, for what it did in shutting all of uh, these uh, uh, these platforms down. And uh, uh, so I, I don't think that there's an argument about that. I think there's some confusion about the understanding of what this represents. Uh, independent of whether NTIA successfully transitions the domain name uh, system, the DNS, to the multi-stakeholder community, these acts of censorship will continue unless we unite across the globe in support of a free and open Internet. I think that that's what we have to keep front and center here. So, Mr. Chairman, I think we have significant work ahead of us. I hope this is the first of many conversations we have uh, to not only examine ICANN's role, but more broadly, how to expand the availability of broadband, enhance consumer privacy, ensure the security of uh, communication networks, and protect intellectual property around the world. Um, my thanks again to the witnesses, and I, I, I want to especially recognize Assistant Secretary Strickling for his leadership and vision uh, to ensure that, um, uh, that throughout this transition, the Internet remains open to all, in capital letters, to all, and that it remain a success story for generations to come. Um, I would like to, I don't know where the time clock is on this. 14 seconds. 14 seconds. Do you want to take 14 seconds, Doris, yes, or we'll have, okay. Well, then I'll yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Chair recognizes the big chair, Mr. Upton from Michigan. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, m my friend. Uh, today our important work continues to protect the future of the Internet, a subject of great consequence for sure. This committee has been at the forefront of the effort to preserve the Internet openness and freedom. A non-regulatory, multi-stakeholder governance model is essential to the continued success of the Internet and has been critical to the development of this engine of economic, political, and social engagement. We have affirmed our commitment to this principle more than once, first with the passage of a sense of the Congress Resolution 2012, and then, of course, with H.R. 1580, which all of us have talked about, which passed uh, by unanimous vote. We must do all that we can to keep the Internet free from the control of those who wish to use it for less than noble means. Keeping it out of the hands of, like, uh, China, Iran, and Russia, who have demonstrated hostility towards the free market, the flowing, unfettered exchange of information is important. NTIA's recent announcement of its intent to transition Internet oversight functions to a new structure should be met with a critical eye, especially when you take into account the administration's track record of saying one thing and doing yet another. This issue has united one-time opponents Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, who are fighting to protect the Internet as we know it. Something as important as the future of the Internet demands a thoughtful and deliberative process, and I join my colleagues in supporting the DOT-COM Act, and I would commend Mr. Shimkus and Ms. Blackburn for co-authoring that measure, as well as Mr. Latta, Elmers, and Barton for their early support, and we plan to announce a markup schedule very soon. This act will stop will step on the brakes until the GAO is able to analyze all the aspects and implications of the proposed shift in Internet oversight, including potential national security concerns. And while I do not oppose a vigorous discussion of whether and how we could transition the, do the domain name system out of the Commerce Department's purview, we are a long way from seeing a proposal that I could support. As the world moves forward with this discussion, we'll conduct vigorous oversight of the process and hold NTIA to its word that it will not allow the Internet to fall victim to international government power grabs. Our work continues. I yield the uh, one minute each to Mr. Shimkus and Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start with a clip um, of President Clinton and the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, as part of my opening statement. 
A lot of people who've been trying to take this authority away from the United States wanted to do it for the sole purpose of cracking down on internet freedom and limiting it and having governments protect their backsides instead of empower their people. So are you at all worried, Jimmy, that, in the, that if we give up this domain jurisdiction that we've had for all these years, that we'll lose internet freedom? Yeah, I'm very worried about it. I'm on a high-level panel at ICANN discussing these issues, and one of the things that really concerns me is some of the other people on the panel, I, I, you know, when they, they talk about, well, it's important that we have uh, respect for local cultures. Okay, I respect local cultures, but I'm not sure if that means I think you, the uh, head of the telecom regulation unit in a particular country, should be banning parts of Wikipedia. That's not, that's not local cultural variation that we should embrace and accept. That's a human rights violation. Mr. Chairman, um, I echo their concerns. As you know, I dropped the dot-com act with Marcia last week. The main critics of my bill seem to be saying that Congress being informed about the proposals presented to NTIA and the process of how this transition would occur would somehow embolden our enemies. I find it hard to believe that the most trans transparent administration in the history of the universe would not want the Congress to be informed on how this process would work. I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses and hopefully we'll get some clarity on how an open and transparent NTIA process, transfer process, is beneficial to a free and open internet. And I yield to uh, Marsha. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his work on the dot-com act. Mr. Chairman, I have to tell you, I thought when you were quoting Margaret Thatcher, and I'm sure Ms. Eshoo and Ms. Matsui joined me in this, I thought you were going to say, since we're talking communications, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman, <laughs> which was also one of Thatcher's very famous quotes. Uh, we all know that the Internet has had a revolutionary impact. Part of this is due to its bottom-up governance and its open ecosystem. And like many of my colleagues, I support a free market, multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance in a perfect world ICANN and IANA would be fully privatized and free from any government influence or control. However, realistically, we know that China, Russia, maybe other bad actors have a different viewpoint. Their end goal is to have ICANN and IANA functions migrate to the UN's ITU. That solution is one that I will never stand for or allow to occur. If the Commerce Department is going to relinquish control of its contractual authority over the IANA contract and move control of DNS into a global multi-stakeholder community, the timing and architecture must be perfect. If this administration wants to prove to Congress and the international community that they are serious about this process, they must immediately begin to end net neutrality proceedings. Telling Congress and the international community that they are serious about relinquishing control while working to promote net neutrality is disingenuous. I thank the chairman. I'll yield back my time. Thank you, General Lee's comments. Now turn to uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Walden, for holding this timely hearing on the National Telecommunications and Information Administration's recent announcement to be begin the process of transitioning key internet domain name functions to the global multi-stakeholder community. I, I want to welcome back uh, Assistant Secretary Larry Strickling and Ambassador David Gross. Uh, your past testimony has greatly enhanced the committee's deliberations on issues related to internet governance. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Jihadi for traveling halfway around the world uh, to take the time uh, to testify be our, before our subcommittee. This distinguished panel of witnesses highlights just how important this upcoming transition will be. This is a critical opportunity to reaffirm the United States' commitment to a multi-stakeholder approach to Internet governance and policymaking. Since the late 1990s, the U.S. government under both Democratic and Republican administrations has consistently embraced the vision that a global Internet should be governed through a decentralized, bottom-up approach with no single government or intergovernmental entity exercising control over its decision-making process. That commitment remains true today. The United States continues to stand up for the multi-stakeholder model time and again 
in international forums while pushing back against countries that have sought an expansion of governmental control. Congress has also spoken unanimously in support of this multi-stakeholder vision, first through a bipartisan, bicameral resolution last Congress, then through legislation that passed the House last year that would make it the official policy of the United States to, quote, preserve and advance the successful multi-stakeholder model that governs the Internet, end quote. I agree it's now time for the U.S. government to take additional steps to fulfill this vision. For over 15 years, NTIA has played a limited procedural role in the administration of the domain name system. This responsibility, while ministerial, is associated with the perception that the United States serves as a steward of the Internet. I share NTIA's belief that this temporary stewardship should come to an end in the near future. The multi-stakeholder system has matured and gained legitimacy over the past decade. I am confident that the non-governmental Internet community will act as capable, responsible stewards of the Internet and fill the role left by NTIA. But the upcoming transition is no, in no way suggests that the United States plans to relinquish control of the Internet to authoritarian states, President Clinton. To the contrary, our efforts should be seen as a vote of confidence that the successful bottom-up decentralized model will continue to preserve and protect the Internet as a free and open platform co for commerce, innovation, and self-expression. NTIA has outlined key principles to guide the transition process, including a commitment not to accept any proposal that replaces the NTIA role with a government-led or intergovernmental organization like the ITU. Yeah. <coughs> Going forward, I hope the NTIA and ICANN will institute an open, transparent process for the consideration of transition proposals submitted by stakeholders. A period of notice and comment should be provided so that the decision makers have a comprehensive record to consider the merits of the proposals. This committee should monitor NTIA's and ICON's effort closely, but we must resist the calls for reactionary legislation that would needlessly tie the hands of the agency. Not only are these efforts inconsistent with Congress's longstanding and bipartisan support for the multi-stakeholder model, they also send a dangerous signal to the rest of the world that we lack faith in the existing multi-stakeholder system. That's why I hope we'll work closely with our witnesses today throughout this transition process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back the balance. Of the gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I think that covers all the uh, opening statements uh, we're allowed to do. So with this, we'll go to our distinguished panel. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Larry Strickling, the Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information Administration, National Telecommunications and Information Administration. That has to be one of the longer titles in the communication world. Larry, thank you for being with us. Uh, we look forward to uh, your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here to testify about NTIA's role working with ICANN and the domain name system, as well as our March 14th release announcing our intent to transition key internet domain name functions to the global multi-stakeholder community. I'm pleased to be joined today by Fadi Shahadi, the CEO of ICANN, and Ambassador David Gross, who was involved in these issues when he served as the State Department Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy during the Bush administration. For 16 years, it has been the clear and unquestioned policy of the United States government that the private sector should lead the management of the domain name system. In its 1998 policy statement, the Department of Commerce stated that the U.S. government is committed to a transition that will allow the private sector to take leadership for DNS management. Since then, the department through NTIA has entered into a series of agreements with ICANN under which it performs what are known as the IANA functions. These include assigning internet protocol numbers to regional registries who then assign them to internet service providers. 
Another function is the maintenance and updating of the root zone file of top-level domain names, the so-called address book for the internet that is necessary for the routing of internet communications. ICANN performs these tasks at no cost to the U.S. government. Our role in this process is simply to verify changes and updates proposed by ICANN to the root zone file before passing these changes on to VeriSign, which actually maintains and updates the root zone file. ICANN, along with other internet technical organizations such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, develop their policies through bottom-up multi-stakeholder processes. These efforts are open to all stakeholders, whether they are businesses, civil society organizations, technical experts, or governments who work in concert to reach consensus agreements on internet policies. And I want to emphasize, because I heard a, a number of references to U.S. control of policymaking at ICANN, and that is not the case. We do not exercise any control or oversight over policymaking. That is performed today by the global multi-stakeholder community uh, working at ICANN or at the IETF. Now, the U.S. government has been a vigorous supporter of the multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance from the start. However, we're not the only ones. As Congresswoman Eshoo pointed out, in 2012, both houses of Congress unanimously passed resolutions stating that it was the consistent and unequivocal policy of the United States to promote a global Internet free from government control and preserve and advance the successful multi-stakeholder model that governs the Internet today. In furtherance of this clear congressional statement, on March 14th, NTIA announced the final phase of the privatization of the domain name system by asking ICANN to convene global stakeholders to develop a proposal to transition the current role played by NTIA in the coordination of the domain name system. In making this announcement, we stated that the transition proposal must have broad community support and must address four principles. It must support and enhance the multi-stakeholder model. It must maintain the security, stability, and resiliency of the Internet domain name system. It must meet the needs and expectations of the global customers and partners of the IANA services. And it must maintain the openness of the Internet. And we also made crystal clear that we will not accept a proposal that replaces the NTIA role with a government-led or intergovernmental solution. We asked ICANN, as the current IANA functions contractor, to convene the multi-stakeholder process to develop the transition plan. We informed ICANN that we expected it to work collaboratively with the other Internet technical organizations, including the Internet Society, the IETF, the Internet Architecture Board, and the regional Internet registries. Last week at its meeting in Singapore, ICANN, working with these organizations, convened two public sessions to obtain stakeholder input on how to design the process to develop the transition plan, collecting several hours of public comment which will help craft a proposal for the process going forward. Stakeholders have responded to our announcement with strong statements of support. Among the business community, Microsoft hailed the announcement as a significant and welcome development. Cisco stated that it has long supported an open and innovative multi-stakeholder internet governance process in this next step in its evolution. From civil society, just yesterday, a group of internet freedom and human rights organizations, including Freedom House, Public Knowledge, Human Rights Watch, and the New America Foundation, welcomed NTIA's announcement stating that it would facilitate the exercise of human rights online. Our announcement in the process that is now underway to develop a transition plan benefits American interests. We depend on a growing and innovative Internet. And despite the symbolic role the U.S. government has played over the years, the fact is that no country controls the Internet. Its continued growth and innovation depends on building trust among all users worldwide and strengthening the engagement of all stakeholders. Taking this measure, uh, taking this action is the best measure to prevent authoritarian regimes from expanding their restrictive policies beyond their own borders. I am confident that the global internet community will work diligently to develop a plan that has the support of the community and meets the four conditions. I want to assure all members that before any transition takes place, 
the businesses, civil society organizations, and technical experts of the internet must present a plan that ensures the uninterrupted, stable functioning of the internet and preserves its openness. Until such time, there will be no change in our current role. I also want to assure all members that even as the United States looks to transition out of this clerical role we play, we will remain strong and vigorous advocates for internet freedom, growth, and innovation. We will continue to play a major role on ICANN's Governmental Advisory Committee, where governments develop consensus advice to ICANN on public policy matters. And we will continue in our role to enhance the accountability and transparency of ICANN through our participation in the accountability and transparency review teams established by the affirmation of commitments we signed with ICANN in 2009. I pledge to keep this subcommittee informed of the progress of the community's efforts to develop the transition plan. And to that end, I look forward to answering your questions this morning. Thank you. Mr. Strickling, thank you very much uh, for your testimony and uh, for always working closely with the subcommittee. We do appreciate that. Uh, now, next up is the uh, president and CEO of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, Mr. Fadi Shahadi. Mr. Shahadi, thank you very much for arranging your schedule to be here before uh, this subcommittee. I think you can tell there's a lot of interest in uh, what is being proposed. So the microphone is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. Uh, it is truly a pleasure for me to be standing before you today to testify. Uh, I was 18 when I came to this country alone, uh, escaping an oppressive regime. And I came with one thing in my hand because I had no money and I didn't speak English. I came with the belief in this open system, in the system that includes everyone, in a system that is truly bottom up. My first boss at at and I of course was addressing him as Mr. Green and he kept saying, no, just call me Bob. I wrote a long letter to my parents about this. Uh, this only happens here, and it, it's these same values of openness, of inclusivity, of belief in the bottom up, that it's from there that the best ideas come. It's that belief that makes me stand in front of you today. I'm here because of that. And it is these same values that underpin the multi-stakeholder model, openness, inclusivity, bottom up participation. It is a phenomenal invention of America. It is even as phenomenal as the internet itself, that we bring everyone together to the table to decide how we govern things together. It is remarkable and it's also worked very well. That's what we should remember. We have now a $4 trillion digital economy in the G20 uh, countries. This is all because of people some of them in this room that I want to recognize, my own chairman, Dr. Crocker, who as kids in Van Nuys High School decided to give it to the world, to build something that was distributed, powerful, and enabled everyone to participate equally. We govern the internet in the same way it works, and that should not change. That inclusivity and that openness guarantees that no one captures the system in the same way the internet is architected, and I'm an engineer, I can tell you that the architecture works this way and the governance should work this way. No one should capture it. And I agree with President Clinton that people will try to capture it, but they haven't. For 15 years, ICANN has operated without government, one government or any government capturing the decision making. Private sector, uh, users, civil society, engineers, academia, all sit together and participate in a process of governing the internet. It's worked remarkably well. Let's keep it this way. And I want today to thank you personally because I was at the wicket when this body's resolution came to us as a strong lightning rod showing America's commitment to the multi-stakeholder model. We trusted it then we should continue trusting it. It works. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that support. The world thanked you for that support, and I do too. NTIA's announcement on March 14th is truly the culmination of 15 years of progressive 
efforts by this administration, by prior administrations, to hand the stewardship of the internet to the people who built it. We're not going to squander this responsibility. This is an important one. We, along with so many companies, welcome that announcement. I think uh, Secretary Strick uh, Assistant Secretary Strickling mentioned the many companies that have come out publicly, the many organizations from all walks of life, businesses, civil society supporting that announcement. They have looked at it and they have supported it and we support it as well. This announcement shows the world America's values again. Who else would do that? What nation would have the vision, the magnanimity, the consistency to do what we're doing here? We're handing the world back what we promised them we would, bottom-up, multi-stakeholder management of this great human resource, this great economic resource. I stand in front of you today with a firm commitment that we will run an open, transparent process. We will keep it calm and wise. We have no rush. There is absolutely no rush. It's more important to get it right than to rush it. That's my commitment to you. We started the process in Singapore, thousands of people there. And at the heart of this proposal is the commitment for security, stability of the internet. That is our number one job. We will not relent on that. We haven't for 15 years. We're not about to start that. That's our commitment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your testimony. Now for our final witness on this panel, we have Ambassador David Gross, partner in Wiley Ryan. Ambassador Gross, good to have you back before our subcommittee. Thanks for your counsel. Please go ahead with your testimony. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Eshu, members of the subcommittee. It's a great pleasure to be back before you again today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, uh, I have a written testimony that I would like to have made a part of the record, if that's Without permitted. objection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm testifying today on behalf of the Internet Governance Coalition, which is a group of global companies and stakeholders that, as all of us are, are important players and stakeholders in the future of the Internet. Our primary focus, as you'll see in our prepared uh, testimony and my statement today, is our firm belief that a thriving Internet depends upon a governance structure that is open, transparent, and representative of all stakeholders. I just returned uh, yesterday from Dubai, where I was a member of the U.S. delegation to the ITU's World Telecommunications and Development Conference part of the ITU's every four-year conference. Uh, I come in with a message that you will find uh, similar to the messages that I have brought before you in the past, which is that the world is watching. The world is watching what NTIA announced back on March 14th. The world is watching the U.S. reaction to that announcement. And the world is watching what here Congress does. It is important that uh, the world understand the bipartisan and unanimous and uniform views of the American people as expressed by this Congress. As you know, the, your role at the World Summit of the Information Society back in 2003 and most importantly in 2005, the role you played in the run-up to the wicket just in 2012 mm -hmm. was decisionally significant. The world watches. The world watches carefully, and the world understands when America acts in a united fashion. We believe very strongly that the process that was begun by NTIA back on March 14th is a good and important process. As has been discussed by all of you, as well as my co-panelists, that process is the beginning of a process. It is not an answer. The answer will come from the Internet community as requested by NTIA. It seems to me, based on my experience, that no one can predict what the specifics of that will be today. But I take great comfort, we take great comfort, in the four principles that were announced by Assistant Secretary Strickling, and importantly, as has been noted repeatedly, that NTIA, on behalf of the U.S. government, will not accept a proposal 
that replaces NTIA's role with a government-led or intergovernmental organization solution. I had a boss when I was in the private sector who used to say and remind all of us of a very important saying, promises made, promises kept. That's what is expected of all of us. That's what we'll be working hard to ensure, that the promises made by NTIA are promises kept by all of us to ensure that that standard, that test, that high bar that was established in the March 14th statement is one that is met by all. And as my co-panelists have indicated, if for some reason, to our great surprise, it cannot be met, we should start over. It should not be rushed. It needs to meet that high test. We are all in agreement on that. The key going forward is to ensure the extraordinary benefits of the internet, not only for the American people, but for people around the world. It is truly one of the great historic achievements of our generation. It is something to be maintained. It is something to be encouraged. And our view is that the, prog that the process that has been begun is designed to do that. The time will come in the future to discuss in detail what substantive proposals are brought forward and their nature and whether or not they are in the public interest or not. But at this stage, we are very comfortable, very, very comfortable that the process that has been done is an important one. It is a real one. It is one that all of us who are optimistic believe it will result in a better internet, a better internet governance situation, and one that would include the fact that promises made by the American people back at the beginning in 1998 our promises kept by all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, and thanks to all of our witnesses on this first panel. I appreciate your counsel and your testimony. So, Mr. Strickling, thank you again for being here. Thanks for uh, briefing us uh, ahead of time uh, before the announcement. How will NTIA ultimately decide whether a proposed transition plan for IANA developed by global stakeholders is acceptable and what factors will you use to determine if such a proposal supports and enhances the multi-stakeholder process, maintains security, stability, resilience uh, in the internet domain name system, and meets the needs and expectations of global customers and partners of the IANA services and maintains the openness? So what, describe for us, what is that process? And once you, uh, what authority do you have to hand this off and sort of back away? Well, you've asked a, a number of questions there. Let me take up the last one initially, which is that um, our role in this historically derives from the decision made in the late 1990s to privatize this. And at that time, NTIA was directed to find an, an organization to perform those roles. So um, we don't do this under any statutory mandate to perform this role. It was done as part of the uh, efforts of the of the government back in the late 1990s but, to privatize. So, our, but you do have a contract with oh, yes, ICANN yes. that is renewable for two four year or two two year. Uh, additions, right? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So the last contract that we did with them in 2012 has a expiration date of September 30th, 2015. But we have within that contract the ability to extend it for up to two two-year right. terms beyond that. So um, as uh, Ambassador Gross said, we have plenty of time to work through these issues. We have certainly teed up the September 2015 as a, as a date that the community might want to use as a target. That's 18 months. Um, should give the community a, a, a ample time to work on this. But there's no cliff if at we, when we reach that time we don't have a proposal presented but to if us. But you, if you have that proposal presented to you, and I want, to, I want you to get to what the criteria would, would be you would go through, and I think you've highlighted some of that in your statement. But is it in effect saying, I'm done with a contract with ICANN? Yes, I think it, if we get to a point, and when we get to the point where there has been an appropriate transition plan presented that satisfies right. all the criteria, um, the idea would be that, that whatever is in that plan would then be put into effect, and we would then uh, be able to just allow our contract with ICANN to expire. And then is there ever any getting that contractual relationship back to NTIA, or is that it for the U.S. in terms of any contractual role with ICANN? Are they on their own then? 
it depends, I think, on the, what comes back to us in the transition plan, but we do not envision that we would then come back and ever contract for the IANA functions at any point in the future. Right. Again, the whole point of this in the late 90s was to identify someone who could take this over and sure. manage it. Again, it's and I at that point that. in time, it was viewed that this com transition would have been complete by the year 2000, as uh, uh, Congresswoman Eshu pointed out. So some might ask what's taken us so long. Sure. But, now, um, in Mr. Del Bianco's uh, stress test scenarios, uh, in his testimony, I assume you've had a chance to read through those. I have. He raises some questions that I think are valid to raise. What happens uh, if ICANN decides to reconstitute itself overseas rather than California out from under the laws? What happens if they go their separate way and thing, start doing things that Mr. Shahadi would never agree to, but he might be gone someday? So... So we have a separate uh, document that we've signed with ICANN called the Affirmation of Commitment. Right. And I think we've been up here and have testified on that in the past. We have not in any way implicated that agreement in any of what we're proposing now. It is under that document that ICANN co has committed to keep its headquarters in the state of California or in the, within the United States. But that States. can be canceled by either party, correct? Yes, there is a with provision 120 under which you day can be notice. And, and you can certainly inquire yeah. of the CEO his intentions with that reg in regard to that. Um, our understanding is that they're quite comfortable maintaining a California office and intend to do so for the foreseeable future, but he can answer Yeah, that and I, I'm looking like beyond all of us. You know, what happens right. 20 um, years but, from but now? But come, let me come back to the, sure. the po point you started with, which were that the questions that are raised by uh, Mr. Del Bianco, we think are important ones. And they really deal, I think, with the symbolic nature of our relationship with the ICANN. I think reflected in many of the comments we heard this morning that people, I think, assume we have much more control over this than in fact we do. Mm -hmm. And it, it's largely symbolic. And I do think it's important as we work through this transition to focus not just on the technical issue of who's going to check the accuracy of root zone file updates, but to also look at the question of uh, how does ICANN continue to perform in an accountable and transparent way, the belief being that we always were there in effect to backstop that in some right. fashion. Um, I think that's a very important set of questions that need to be answered in this process. We intend to participate vigorously in that because we and uh, other American uh, business and civil society interests have a stake in that as right. well, and that's part of the process. And I've overshot my time. Thank you very much. I now turn to the gentlelady from California. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to go to um, my colleagues, and uh, I can go last. So I don't know who is here first, Mr. Doyle? We're both here together. Okay. Well, remember Mr. Doyle, and then... Are, are you uh, passing to them rotate, or yielding? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll yield my time. You're passing. You're uh, yielding yeah, I'll or pass? pass. Uh, whatever is the best. How's that? I, I would All assume right? you want to just defer to Mr. Doyle and not give up your time. Yeah, I'll... I'll we I'll need I can to arbitrate. I'll question today. last. How's that? That's <laughs> fine. Then I, the chair would now recognize Mr. Doyle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, wow, we're getting that same. Thank you for your testimony today. I, th I think uh, uh, just your testimony has gone a long way in... in clearing up, I think, some of the misconceptions uh, that have come from this announcement. Uh, Mr. Strickling, I, you know, when you talk about stakeholders, tell us, who, who are the stakeholders? I mean, name, give us some of the names of the people uh, in this multi-stakeholder process we're talking about. Who are we really talking about? So at the, high, at the broadest level, it's anyone interested in these issues. And in fact, that's uh, large American companies as well as small and medium-sized Like AT&T, Verizon, yes. Comcast, yes, Google, all of those. Facebook, Yahoo. Yes. Right, this, is what, these are, these, this is what we're talking about. Right. And, and who else is in this stakeholder process? The civil society organizations who are so focused on Internet freedom and free flow of information are part of this process. Again, you'll hear from a representative of them in the second panel and they've issued statements of support in that regard. Technical experts have been at the core of this from the beginning, folks like Vince Cerf, uh, um, Bob Kahn, uh, Steve Crocker, who's in the right. audience so, today. So what we're talking about this. really is, is an, an evolution of, of transitioning this to the private sector. 
right? I mean, this, this is like a, I don't believe NTIA controls ICANN. I think that, that's pretty clear that you have a ministerial role. You don't control the process. Uh, but I would think my colleagues over here would, would love the notion that the government's transferring something over to the private sector. Would, would the gentleman uh, yield just for sure, clarification? Sure, I'll yield the chairman. Because I think also part of ICANN, there is a government influence as well, right, on your board. Yes, there's But the nobody controls ICANN. Right. So, so we don't, to the point. It's not yeah. like we're giving up control of something. We don't control it. So I, I, that's the point I wanted right. to make. And, and the stakeholders we're talking about are private companies and civil society, a civil engine, right? I mean, that, I just think that needs to be said publicly because you use that word stakeholders, and a lot of people don't seem to understand what, what we're talking about. Let me ask you something else, Mr. Strickland. When you were proceeding with this announcement, did you consult with other branches of the federal government, like the State Department, the Department of Defense, intelligence agencies, and other agencies with a stake in U.S. national security and foreign policy? Yes. And when you did that, did any of these uh, gov branches of government object to your announcement on the basis that it would have a negative impact on U.S. foreign policy or national security? No. So, Ambassador Gross, let me ask you, af after the United States transitions the IANA contract, what will be the means for our government to participate in the multi-stakeholder process? Well, I think there are two pieces to, uh, in answer to that uh, important question. Uh, one is, as has been indicated, uh, the U.S. government has participated in the GAC, which is the Government Advisory Committee, which is a committee of ICANN, uh, and based on the testimony and, of course, uh, our understanding that will continue as it has in the past. Uh, the second part, though, I think is yet to be determined. That is, the question is uh, on the IANA functions themselves and the relationship between the U.S. government and those functions. It has been asked by NTI of the uh, Internet community, asking uh, ICANN to be the convener for the specifics of what a proposal would look like. Mm -hmm. I think it's premature for any of us to know the true answer to your important question until we see what that proposal actually looks like. And, and just one last question. How can in Internet governance bodies like ICANN and IGF and others preserve a free and open expression on the Internet and push back against some of these governments that are restricting speech online by blocking citizens' access to <coughs> services like Wikipedia and YouTube and Twitter and others? What can we do to, to push back against that? Well, first and foremost, uh, we need to ensure that ICANN continues as it has in the past to be committed, as uh, uh, Mr. Shahadi has indicated today, its commitment to making sure that the Internet continues to be open. On that question. Uh, NTIA importantly said that that is one of the primary criteria that it will be looking at as it evaluates whatever proposal comes forward from the Internet community. And also, if I may also suggest that the United States government writ large, all branches of the government, need to continue to do what they have been doing for years now, which is to speak loudly, speak clearly, and speak to this issue on an ongoing basis, both with friends and with foes. It is important to be consistent. I am pleased that how consistent the U.S. government has been. It should continue to be so. Mr. Sir, uh, Chairman, I see my time is almost over. Maybe, Mr. Strickling, do you want to react to that question, too, in the last 10 seconds? I think the ultimate end of this has to be to continue to build and support stakeholders throughout the world because what the strongest push against these kinds of restrictive policies in these countries is to have a citizenry and a community in those countries that push back from within um, and ultimately that's what it's going to take to, to end these policies. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. I uh, will now turn to the vice chair of the full, no, the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, I think, is actually next, uh, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, uh, thanks very much to our witnesses for being here today. It's uh, very, very important to uh, the folks in this room and across the country. Uh, Mr. Strickling, if I could uh, just uh, ask you a couple of questions right off the bat. Uh, you know, Ohio is very fortunate to have the, uh, the Cleveland Clinic in our in our state and it's uh, you know na it's not only nationally known but uh, worldwide uh, renowned for what it does and uh, Cleveland clinics applied to operate a dot med top level domain are you familiar with that I am okay 
Uh, for the record, uh, Cleveland Clinic's application was rejected and has since been filed, has filed a request for reconsideration. That's correct. Okay, and uh, we're concerned, you know, across the state about the transparency and the predictability of ICANN's current process regarding the request for reconsideration and how this transition of NTIA's oversight responsibilities might further impede the process. Are there any assurances that NTI can provide that the transition of ICANN's IANA functions would not negatively impact the status of the current applicant's uh, filings being reviewed by ICANN? Right, it will have no impact on that. So you can, right now, so the folks that have got applications out there, you can say there's no, no impact at all then? Is that correct then? Not on the basis of this announcement, no. Okay. And then without the NTI oversight, will NTI ensure that any multi-stakeholder proposal accepts include rigorous transparency and openness standards for ICANN processes going forward? Absolutely. And not just that, but we expect to see that same level of transparency throughout the process to develop a plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shahadi, if I could, and I hope, did I hope I said that correctly. Uh, are there current policies in place that I can to promote that transparency and openness in its processes? And again, as you've heard from this, the testimony this morning and also from your attendance at, uh, at the Wicket, you know, we've, we had hearings uh, last year uh, when uh, we heard about different countries that wanted to go beyond what was supposed to be proposed at that meeting. And uh, so when you're looking at uh, some of the countries looking at trying to use the guise of uh, cybersecurity and things like to really get at the Internet for their own really uh, censorship of that Internet, uh, you know, what, what can we really make sure that we can tell our constituents and people across the country that, you know, as we go forward that there is going to be that transparency and openness in the process? Uh, I think the commitment of ICANN to transparency is enshrined in our affirmations. Uh, we should live by these, and I can assure you that since I've arrived, I've put additional resources and effort to ensure that we adhere to our transparency mechanisms. Uh, we continue to uh, keep every process we make open. Uh, we make sure it's inclusive, that anyone can participate. We now translate everything we do in all the UN languages plus Portuguese. Uh, ensure that people can participate in all of our meetings remotely, even when they can't be there. Transparency is at the center, at the heart of what we do. Okay, if, if I just follow up, uh, you said uh, that there would be additional resources that uh, you'd be committing. What, what are those additional resources? So these are uh, people that are engaged uh, in making sure that all of these processes are recorded, are made available openly, that people can participate when they need to, uh, and ensure that no one can say that we did some process uh, quietly, quickly, or without full availability of participation for everyone. Okay, thank you. And then also, is there more that ICANN can be doing to improve upon those policies, ensure that the applicants for domain names are fully informed and aware of the organization and structure of the ICANN processes? There's always more we can do. And uh, since we've arrived, uh, this ICANN administration has added uh, uh, systems for uh, uh, managing the stakeholders' relations. We've uh, more than tripled now the size of the team that is supporting applicants. Uh, we have uh, made sure that that team is available globally 24 hours a day, five days a week. So there's a, a series of things we've done to actually enhance the service to the applicants and ensure that they're well informed of what we're doing. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'll uh, you back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Chair now recognizes the lady from California, Ms. Matsui, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. Um, I really am uh, very much involved and interested in governance, because I think governance is key to everything, whether it's a, a government, or whether it's a nonprofit organization, city council, or whatever. And I believe that, in particular, this is a huge undertaking. And I know we've kind of marched through this for 15 years. But I think now, in particular, the internet is at a different place, obviously. And the uh, participants in the internet are huge, it's global. So my sense is that in the governance model, is it's unlike many others in the sense that as we move along, there will be more and more voices or stakeholders to be addressed. So my sense is that I'm glad that you're taking your time 
because I think that's really very important because as more and more information goes forward, I think that you'll have more and more stakeholders. I'm really pleased that the administration, Mr. Strickling, has really committed to support no proposal that really does not support a free and open internet. I think that's really very important as a principle moving forward. And I do recall, since I was in the Clinton administration, how this process moved forward. And I don't think any of us really envisioned quite where it would be today as far as even the users of the internet. However, having said that, it is, it is really huge in a sense of where we are today. And this is not about creating headlines at all. It's real, and it's about ensuring that the internet governance transition moving forward is responsible to Americans and the whole digital economy. And so I want to know something about this in a sense because, Mr. Strickling, um, do you think there are any other processes or procedures that should be put in place to ensure I can review the proposals by stakeholders in an open and transparent way? We have not asked ICANN to be a reviewer of proposals. We've asked them to convene the process by which the community will develop a proposal to submit to us. We expect that we will get a proposal that is, uh, has the support of the community and meets the criteria we've laid out for it. Um, so there's no process by which there's some judge over at ICANN who's going to be a de decision maker on this. It's what emerges from the community discussions in the form of a community proposal to us. Okay, well, thank you. And Mr. Chahadi, you are very eloquent uh, in your uh, testimony. It really does um, indicate to us why this internet and ICANN is so important moving forward. Um, so therefore, uh, Mr. Chahadi, can you commit to a, I mean, we're saying this over and over again, but I think it's really important, an open and transparent process for the deliberation of any transition proposal that will provide an opportunity for notice and comment, not only to organize civil society and well-financed stakeholders, but also now, you know, to the general public, because we have participants that are worldwide here. Absolutely. If we do not do that, the process should not be accepted by uh, NTIA, in our opinion. In other words, we are expected to do this. We will do it. Without it, this process is not legitimate. Okay. And not only are we going to do it within the ICANN community, which is growing and vast now globally, we will reach out to other communities. We will hold public consultations at the IETF. We will hold public consultations with the regional internet registries. We will hold public consultations with the internet society globally. We already announced an extensive schedule of listening and bringing to consensus all the communities towards a proposal that will be acceptable to NTIA. Would this also include other communities like academic communities and generally speaking a broader community which generally isn't part of the so-called internet organizations? The answer is yes. In fact, uh, I, we are in discussions right now with the Harvard Berkman Center and the NYU Governance Lab in New York to actually, uh, along with multiple universities around the world, start a process to uh, have the academic uh, community participate uh, in the future of where we head here. So absolutely. And also, too, I'm wondering whether, you know, think about governance. Um, are you also consulting with people who deal with governance and what works and what doesn't work? Now, this is a whole new, uh, I think, level of governance, so to speak, because we're dealing with something, in a sense, that touches every sector of society, every sector of business, every sector, of, and we don't know yet what's going to be happening down the road. So I think it's important to understand what could happen and may not happen. And yes. The, the answer is absolutely yes. We have to be using the same innovation that led us to the internet in the process of designing that process. Mm -hmm. So we met, uh, I met with Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard. We're meeting with Professor Beth Novak at NYU. Many, many academics around the world who understand how to innovate in governance 
to make them part of the process. Okay, well, thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlelady's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, for thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, and I will note for the committee and those present that Mr. Rakita, who worked with us on the DOTCOM Act, walked back with me from Budget Committee, where I'm splitting my time today so that he could be a part of, uh, of our hearing. Mr. Strickling, first to you. Uh, getting ready for the hearing, I went back and looked at some of the Wicket 12 uh, comments. Ambassador Vivier had made a quote, and I want to ask you if you agree with this. He says, discussions with figures in various governments around the world, there is a very significant preoccupation with respect to what we are proposing with respect to broadband and especially with respect to net neutrality. The proceeding is one that could be employed by regimes that don't agree with our perspectives about essentially avoiding regulation of the internet and trying to be sure not to do anything to damage its dynamism and its organic development. It could be employed as a pretext, he's talking about net neutrality, or as an excuse for undertaking public policy activities that we would disagree with pretty profoundly, ending quote. Uh, you agree with that statement? Um, I guess I neither agree nor disagree because I don't know the context in which it was stated. I, I think it's a statement from a few years ago. I, I can state that it has not been put into the record by governments in the fashion that, that it sounds like Ambassador Revere feared at the time. Well, do you think that the U.S. could set a better example about Internet governance and uh, a multi-stakeholder approach to Internet governance by stopping the push for net neutrality? I think the best example the United States can set is to proceed with the proposal that we made on March the 14th. Yesterday, Michael O'Reilly, who is one of the FCC commissioners, uh, issued this statement. At this pivotal moment for Internet freedom, the FCC's net neutrality proceeding could severely contradict and underestimate the U.S. government's international position. So, how can the U.S. government tell the world to accept a multi-stakeholder model while at the same time the FCC is working with the White House's approval to impose greater control of the Internet through net neutrality? Your question? How can the U.S. government tell the world that they want them to accept a multi-stakeholder process when within our government the FCC is pushing forward to implement net neutrality rules? Well, I think we're comparing apples and oranges. When we're talking about inter international internet governance, we're talking about governments acting collectively Sir, in this space. Sir, I think that a lot of innovators have conflated the two. And I think that that is truly a problem with us, that there has been a conflating. And th we are not setting a good example on that. Uh, you referenced the affirmation document point eight of that, which would mean that uh, the governance for the internet, for ICANN, would stay domiciled in the United States. Do you expect that to hold? I do, but you have the CEO right next to me. And you might I plan ask him directly. to ask him. I am going to go directly to him with that question. So, Mr. Shahadi, to you, would you expect that to hold? I do. Uh, it's worked very well for us. It's worked very well for the world. So I think uh, before what any change, we should changing? be conscious of that. Pardon? What would keep it from changing? Uh, to keep the model that is working, uh, to the world working well by supporting the model that works. The more we try to exert one government's influence on the model, the more people will want to move it elsewhere. The more we show them that we support the multi-stakeholder model, the more they'll say, this works. Well then, uh, and I want to say I appreciate the conversation that I've had with you, and I know that you have a difficult task in front of you because there is such a low level of trust yeah. with this administration. And I would just ask you, sir, when we look at a multi-stakeholder model <coughs> that is free from government control, what kind of message is this administration sending if the FCC continues to push forward with regulation of the internet and net neutrality standards? Again, from my perspective, the best example I can continue giving the world is that the U.S. government is united behind the multi-stakeholder model that enabled the Internet and ICANN. 
and I will continue seeking your support for that. Would your job be easier if the FCC stopped being an activist agency and trying to force net neutrality? I'm making my job easier by clarifying to people that what ICANN does has nothing to do with content. We are just managing names and numbers, and we will do it well. And I hope that the success of our work in this area uh, spreads in the world, not just in the U.S., but in the world. Thank you. Yield back. General H. Time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I know, although we're here to talk on a specific topic, it seems that the hearing is turned towards net neutrality as well. And um, as we talk about the basic structure associated with the United States and the FCC, making sure that they are inserting themselves into this conversation, um, I think blends to what we're talking about today, keeping things open, uh, making sure that everyone can access that, um, and I appreciate this from our staff as well, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the, on the minority side. Open internet rules are not government regulation of the internet. Net neutrality is about ensuring that the broadband service providers that control the on-ramps to the internet don't become the gatekeepers with the power to favor their own content, throttle some applications, or block consumers' access to information. And I think that's an example to the rest of the world as we talk about this, not a hindrance to the rest of the world. So I hope that we're able to find some agreement there as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, my, my questions today center a bit around the affirmation of commitments um, to talk a little bit about that. But I think that you know, I agree with some of my colleagues on this committee that we need to send a strong message to the world that the internet has thrived under a decentralized, bottom-up, multi-stakeholder governance model and that we should all commit ourselves to the free market, multi-stakeholder internet governance model that has worked so well in the past. And those are quotes from 2012 and 2013 by one of my colleagues as well. And I wholeheartedly agree with her and hope that we can find a way to um, work together in this area um, uh, as well. Uh, but in the area with the affirmation of commitments, um, specifically about, from a response from NTIA that the affirmation is an agreement that includes multi-stakeholder oversight mechanisms to address accountability, transparency, and ICANN's decision-making, the security, stability, and resiliency of the internet, DNS, as well as promote competition, consumer trust, and consumer, ch consumer choice. How do you envision the affirmation of commitments will function after the management of the DNS is completely privatized? Um, so we haven't in our announcement done anything to suggest it need to change at all. We recognize, though, that as the community starts to address the questions of ICANN accountability, that the matters covered in the affirmation, which you just summarized, may well come into that discussion, and we certainly have no problem with that being the case. Um, in the meantime, we will continue to press for increased accountability and transparency, although I will say, um, from my own experience of having served on two of the accountability and um, transparency review teams, the two that have um, happened so far, um, ICANN is about the most accountable and transparent organization I've dealt with. That's not to say it can't be improved, and indeed, out of the last team we presented, um, uh, I think more than a dozen recommendations of additional steps ICANN can take, and that will always be the case. We'll always be able to find things they can do to improve, but um, the progress that they've made over the last four years in this area has been quite substantive and was part of, of the factors leading us to make the announcement we made two weeks ago that it was now time to proceed with the final phase of the privatization. And I would just add that I hope that the affirmation of commitments becomes and will always be a staple associated with the transition as well as the permanency associated with this conversation. Um, and, and another question that I have is, what is VeriSign's role and responsibility? Um, I know that when we go to websites, you see the VeriSign sign there, and it's to encourage uh, trust to, to individuals. But what exactly does that VeriSign mean? So VeriSign's, you know, a, a large company involved in a number of different places in the Internet. So, for example, most people know them uh, through their, uh, um, re they're the registry for .com, uh, which is the largest of the top-level domain names. With respect to the IANA functions, 
the specific role they perform is that after um, ICANN, through its policymaking process, sends to us a change for the root zone file, we verify its accuracy, we pass it on to VeriSign, who actually performs the updating of the 13 authoritative root zone servers uh, with that information. So that's the specific role they play with respect to IANA. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I, as my time runs out, I think what, you know, what that translates to is VeriSign or is saying that this website is coming from where it says that it's coming from. But I hope that the committee would entertain a conversation down the road um, with uh, trust with best practices that we as consumers can also use down the road, which is not a topic for today, but one I think that we can explore to help consumers down the road to, to make sure that when they're seeing information, they know exactly what it means as opposed to seeing VeriSign, as some constituents have reached out to me and said, they completely trust the content um, and those that are behind what is being moved as opposed to the DNS being tied to um, or, or the IP protocol where it's coming from. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hearing today. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for your input. Uh, I think that's a very good point. We'll go now to the uh, former chairman of the committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, let me say to Mr. Chahadi, we, very, we rarely have testimony that's inspirational, uh, but yours was. I mean, I wish we had a <clears throat> copy of that to show school children what um, what America's all about that was that really was moving to me um, so I'll ask you the first question have you ever heard of the uh, phrase if it's not broke don't fix it well when I was listening to you and I'm I'm at right at right at this point neutral but suspicious of this proposal it dawned on me Everything you said, I agree with. If it's working, you know, what's so wrong with the current system that we want to change it? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I do believe that there is a confusion as to what NTIA has <coughs> announced. What is working will not change. ICANN's work to administer these functions is already with us, has been with us, and we've managed it well for 15 years. That's not about to change. And I think the stability of that is important. It sends the right message to the world. What is changing is the accountability mechanisms, the, the, really the stewardship that the US government has kept over our activity. Today, that is shared between the US government and our community. In fact, it's not just the US government that ensures we do what we say we need to do. We go through reviews with uh, the engineers at the IETF who meet me every quarter, check on my performance. So there are other mechanisms already in place to make sure we do what we do. The role that the US played progressively became smaller over the years and has now become largely symbolic. By letting the multi-stakeholder model take that role and strengthen our existing mechanisms to make sure we're accountable, we're sending a message to the world that we trust the multi-stakeholder model. They need to hear that. And today, more than ever, we need the world to hear that because other issues of internet governance are coming up in the world. We want them to look at ICANN and say, this is working, and the multi-stakeholder model well, works. It's, it's a little bit of a stretch, but, you know, after World War II, we, we put U.S. troops in Japan, we put U.S. troops in Germany, um, 70 years later, 60 years later, uh, the world has changed, but we still have some U.S. troops in Germany and some U.S. troops in Japan. Um, the Internet got started in the United States, and, and to, to the credit of lots of people, uh, we've tried to decentralize and, and, and have the government step back and assume more of a, a ministerial or just a kind of an oversight role. But what gives the world community faith in the Internet is that they know they have the full faith and credit of the U.S. government behind it. And our ideals, as established in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, are for openness and transparency. If, if ICANN were to decide to move its headquarters to North Korea, 
uh, that might not hold true. So, you know, I, I, I read your little booklet here, which is very in, informational. It, you give the Department of Defense a run for the money on uh, acronyms, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, you know, what people like me, or, I'm a market guy, I'm a free market guy. Um, and, and I can intellectually understand what you're attempting to do, but there's just, a, at the back of my mind, there's, there's that, you know, there's that old Reagan phrase, trust but verify. Yes. And that's what we don't want to give up. I have no problem with this multi-stakeholder community, and I looked at all your organizations and, and, and all that, but, but people like me are a little bit afraid that if, if NTEIA steps back and, and, and we just get, so, we, so there's not that real kind of FDIC guarantee, so to speak, to use a banking analogy, that the next, part, the next government that might want to try to do something, the Chinese, the Russians, who knows, they might not take the same attitude as the U.S. government. That's what people like me are concerned about. Um, and my last question, my time's expired. Is there any country that's not not a part of uh, ICANN? Yes, we have 133 countries represented now, although the attendance beyond government representatives is now covering almost all countries in the world. And I want to say, if I could, uh, Mr. Barton, that I actually 100% agree with you that we must have the right belts and suspenders on the proposal we give back to the U.S. government. And frankly, if it doesn't, I'll be the first one to not submit that proposal. Okay. Well, that's my concern. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy, and I yield back. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Shahadi. We'll now turn to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Okay, no, you already Mr. went. Already I'm sorry. Asked. Then we'll go, go to... Go first. Then I'd be delighted to go to Ms. Eshoo. Maybe we should note that it's a first. We're ranking member. The last shall be first. How's that? That's a great... Um, uh, quote from uh, from scripture. Uh, well, I, I want to thank each one of you because I think that this is a um, um, really one of the best panels um, we've had before the subcommittee. Uh, each one of you has been outstanding. You uh, are rooted in very broad and deep experience, and uh, we're very grateful to you. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Shahadi, uh, I think that you make the case. Um, this morning in such a elegant and eloquent way uh, that, uh, that immigration is the lifeblood of our nation. You wouldn't be before us if uh, that were not the case. And I wouldn't be here as a first generation, none of us would, if that wasn't one of the great, great values of our country. So uh, thank you to each one of you for your testimony. It seems to me that um, we are all saying the same thing except there's kind of a hairball in this thing. Um, I would think that uh, multi-stakeholder, all the companies and corporations, the private sector that have weighed in on a, uh, uh, on a multi-stakeholder model um, uh, would be so embraced by every single colleague here. Um, but we have a fear of moving away from U.S. government perceived control to the control of some bad actor countries. Uh, now, that's a huge leapfrog when we go from NTIA to North Korea. But really, that's what the fear is on, on, uh, uh, on this side of the aisle. Um, what I'm concerned about is that, and uh, Ambassador uh, 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 Gross uh, underscored this, is that everything we say, everything we do is being measured, especially by the countries that do not agree with our principles, our democratic principles that are built into the internet. So can someone give the assurance to this notion that regardless of how the Congress voted 
413 to zip, with all of the principles that were in it, that somehow we are weakening the path forward and that the bad guys, the bad actors in the world, will be able to snatch this away from us and uh, do to the internet what they do to their own people. Because I really think that's the central question that's here. Um, uh, because that's the fear. And fear is, um, uh, if you list human emotions, it's the top one. So uh, who would like to go at that and um, perhaps develop some comfort level here with uh, my colleagues? So I'll start, but I think this is a good question for everyone on the panel. So first off, I understand the concern, um, but it's not going to happen, partly because one of our key conditions is we will not accept a proposal that turns this over to a government-led or intergovernmental organization, so it's off the table. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, I'm not sure we needed to say that, in, because it, I don't think there was ever any prospect we were going to get a proposal like that. The multi-stakeholder community, again, formed by civil society organizations and large, small, medium-sized corporations, would never have brought a proposal like that back to us. I am not sure what people see as the possible mechanism by which a, a, an authoritarian regime would seize control of the domain name system. Um, I think it, it's an unlikely thing to occur, but one way to prevent it from ever occurring is to make sure we have strong multi-stakeholder groups in countries such as in the developing world who would have to be part of any process to yeah, try to I, I just want to move interrupt. To UN you know control. what happens around here, though, is that someone or a group uh, make a statement, and then it becomes a fact. And uh, more than anything else, I think that's what has happened. And there are some outside of this institution that, um, well, I, I'm just, I'm not going to go there because it's not worth it. But I, I would just like uh, uh, both uh, Mr. Chahadi and uh, Ambassador uh, Gross to go at this. I only have 19 seconds, and I'd also like to ask that uh, uh, a unanimous consent to place in the record statements uh, of support from really the father of the internet, uh, Vint Cerf, uh, the former FCC commissioner, uh, McDowell, the Internet Association, Cisco, and a letter from six NGOs. So with what I have, well, I have- Without uh, objection. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll simply say that uh, to Mr. Strickling, if he had not put that condition, I would have made sure it's put. Mm -hmm. So. This is an important condition, and I understand Mr. Strickling's comment that it wouldn't have happened, but it's good for the world to understand this is impossible to happen. It will not happen. And I believe we will come back with a proposal that allays all these fears. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, the only thing I can add is we have a commitment from people to my right that no proposal that will allow that will go forward. We have a commitment from the U.S. government that no such proposal could be accepted. And on behalf of our constituents, we will be watching. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the uh, witnesses. Just a, an outstanding panel. Thank the gentlelady for her comments, and uh, now we'll go to Mr. Shimkus from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Questions. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Strickland, as you know, I introduced the .com Act last week with several of my colleagues as co-sponsors. Is NTI opposed to the Government Accountability Office providing to Congress prior to a transition of IANA functions? Are you opposed to a, a government accountability office review to ensure what you have testified today is, is true? Well, Congressman, as I understand it, you can request a GAO study. Well, my, question is, want, so. my question is, do you oppose us asking for a government accountability office review to ensure your testimony today uh, that we have comfort in, in that? I see. N n n it doesn't really matter what I think. You no, I, that study. you're here. I'm at, do you oppose? Or do you say it's not a big deal? Go ahead. I'm in favor of full discussion of these issues. So members, you're I'm happy to talk to you. So you agree. You, you, so, you, so you support a government accountability office review. You, I, it could be helpful. I, I neither support nor oppose it. I'm simply telling you. I wish Mr. Dingle was here. If I, if I was, if Mr. Dingle... Yes or no, do you, would you support a government accountability review of this transition? Again, I have no problem full airing and discussion of these issues. So I, I guess I'm going to take that as yes, Mr. Chahadi. 
Um, uh, I do not have a view on uh, on a particular government. You, you all have made a great promise. Having, having said that, I will commit to you, as I did yesterday, that everything we were asked to do, we will do in full transparency to you and to the world. So a Without Government Accountability Office review of this proposal should not be a challenge or at risk to you? I think uh, reviews by anyone, and there will be many around the world, of our accountability in that process. So I guess make, I can make assume the that as, stronger. as a yes. The, well, again, I, I do not, <laughs> uh, as I told you yesterday, <laughs> ICANN is a global organization. I, but the, we have to no, I, I only have got two minutes. I've got like three questions, and if I have time, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah. Secretary Groves. I'd like to uh, associate myself with the prior you know, comments, but I, I will say that more information is better. Thank the process should be open, should be transparent. More information is always helpful. And we understand the GAO is the Government Accountability Office. It's our arm. It's, it's nonpartisan. It looks, it evaluates to ensure that things that we are concerned with, we have another look which is what you all are saying. I, I'm actually kind of shocked at the, uh, the frustration of this because I think it would help bring more education, more transparency, and, and maybe uh, uh, resolve some of the, uh, the fear. Ambassador Gross, uh, what is to prevent a multi-stakeholder model from then choosing to transition to a government-led ITU model of internet governance? I think you've gone to the very core of what will be required of any proposal going forward. The problem we all have, and I include myself in this, is that at the moment we are at the beginning of a process. To answer your question, your important question, we have to know the answer at the end. We don't know that. The question now becomes one for the community, the internet community, to come up with a creative, important, and belt and suspenders answer so that the question you ask is fully answered. And, and don't you think we have a right to ask these questions? I think and, undoubtedly so. And the government to do the investigation to find out some of these answers? I think that it's completely up to all Thank of you. you to be able to figure out what your comfort level Thank is. Thank you. Mr. Shahadi, I've been involved in Eastern European issues my whole career up here. Uh, what is the current internet country code for the Crimea region of Ukraine? Is it dot .ru or is it dot .ua? Uh, again, we, we follow what the UN, uh, in terms of country codes, we follow the UN uh, coding. So even when South Sudan was created, we had to wait for the UN to issue uh, the actual code, and then that's when we... So you don't know right now of any plans to change that? No. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to end there. I, I, I just want to highlight to my friends here on both sides... We take an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We take that seriously. Uh, I don't pledge to some international organizations or governments. Um, due diligence by the legislative branch of this government is not harmful to this process. In fact, I, I would argue that it could be very, very helpful, and, and I appreciate your testimony on, in support of that, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Thank you, and it, I, I think everyone has the same theme and, in a way, kind of answer, asking the same questions. And, but I'm, I want to use a different terminology, at least. We talk about you won't accept, Mr. Strickland, Strickland, the, the proposal, and, and you wouldn't accept as the CEO the proposal. I think a lot of our, not distrust, but questions are what happens after the proposal is accepted. I think all of us in this room have probably experienced some bait and switch at some point in time, whether it was a meaningful fraud or things just okay, you have this new governance and it develops its own personality and over time they expand their abilities uh, uh, and what they can cover or what they de determine provides certainty uh, within the system. And so I want to ask uh, what the, the whole panel, what happens when 
a scenario occurs where they start expanding the power. For example, saying, geez, if uh, that website's going to use too much bandwidth, uh, where you have to put up so much money, or there has to be some conditions tied to that. How do, how do we prevent that from occurring and the new s stakeholder group accepting that when there's no NTIA to verify, hey, that's not within your jurisdiction. Because it sounds like once they develop uh, the new governing body of ICANN, that there's no more check left. And frankly, and we've heard it, we don't trust Russia or China when they're sitting on there, or Iran, or now Turkey to make policy decisions. And I know we're only talking about domain names, but they can sit there and say, this is tied to a domain name because we're not gonna issue you a domain name or uh, a root because. Mr. Strickland. Well, again, I think that misapprehends what we do today. Um, the policy making in ICANN today is performed by the multi-stakeholder community. Um, the United States participates in that process, not through the IANA functions contract, but through our participation in the Governmental Advisory Committee. That's not changing. We're not going away. As I said in my opening statement, we will remain vigorous advocates for a free and open Internet through the Government Advisory Committee, um, and we'll be joined in that by a number of other like-minded governments participating in that. So, All right, um, help me work through that, because that's, that's somewhat confusing to me. So now today, as I understand, uh, like if France on a root file, uh, ICANN approves it, but then it comes to you for just the double check verification. In terms of there's our, no yes. entity, once the proposal is accepted, there's no entity then other than just the ICANN board. So if they make a mistake, there's no one there to verify it now. Is that a correct? Well, our role is doesn't even necessarily look back at the board process. We what we look at is kind of the technical accuracy, and it's kind of a checklist to make sure that what's being sent through followed all the appropriate uh, procedures to come through, and we verify its accuracy. So, to the extent that. First off, the policies probably aren't going to be as specific as your example in terms of some specific requests. But we France. don't know. Hmm? We don't know that. Well, but it would still be based on the overall policy for top-level domains established by the uh, constituency organizations within ICANN. So if your example is dealing with .fr, the country code, that's one supporting organization at ICANN. If, if France, uh, the government, is dealing with a uh, generic top-level domain, that goes to a separate su uh, supporting organization. So that's where the policy making is done. And in those sessions, you have the people who are involved in those different communities participating and in, in answering those questions. So that today happens through a multi-stakeholder process. Um, and then the Governmental Advisory Committee sits separately to resolve public policy issues that may emerge out of the policy making that um, has happening in these other organizations. And it's there that uh, through consensus policies, uh, the governments can speak to particular issues. Anyone else? Uh well, I, I could add, uh, Congressman, that as part of our proposal back to NTIA, our community is going to be very alert to put these belts and suspenders in that proposal to avert the potential down the line uh, of things going awry. Um, we don't know what this will look like, as Ambassador Gross said. We need to uh, get the community involved in designing that process. But you heard uh, today mention uh, by one of the panelists on a panel coming up uh, that there are ideas for testing various models to test uh, this. I am sure our community that doesn't let me change the brand of coffee in my cafeteria, <laughs> I have thousands of people watching everything we do, will be on top of that. And we'll make sure that the proposal comes back with the right uh, guarantees as best we can that this thing does not go the wrong way. Yield back. 
Gentleman yields back, balance of his time. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing. Appreciate our panelists for being here as well. This is an issue that I know a lot of us are real concerned about as we, as we look at all the questions and, and potential ramifications that are involved in, in NTIU making any kind of changes to this uh, to the ICANN process and the multi-stakeholder process that, that works so well. I, I've been a strong component, a strong supporter of an uh, open and free Internet, and especially free from, uh, free from governments that, that have an interest in, in taxing, restricting, censoring uh, the Internet and, and the ability of its people to use it and all the power uh, that, that, that people have been empowered with uh, to, uh, to do the things that they've done because of it. So I, I know I, I support... Uh, Congressman Shimkus' bill that he's going to be bringing forward, the .com Act, uh, that, that, that puts some of those belts and suspenders that you're talking about in place to, to, to slow this thing down and say, let, let's get a real clear picture of what we're looking at, because there are a lot of unanswered questions uh, when, we, when we look at the ramifications of this. I, I, I don't find it often where I can quote the Heritage Foundation and Bill Clinton in the same sentence, uh, both in support of the same thing. Uh, but just last week, uh, I think you may have heard uh, Bill Clinton express concerns about this, uh, as did the Heritage Foundation and even the Washington Post. And uh, the concern was that uh, giving up ICANN could open the door, quote, open the door to nations that don't value an open and free Internet. And, and just to go one step further, this is a, an actual quote uh, from former President Clinton. A lot of people have been trying to take this authority away from the U.S. for the sole purpose of cracking down on Internet freedom and limiting it and having government protect their backsides instead of empowering their people. Uh, these are serious concerns being raised uh, by, again, people that don't always see eye to eye uh, but share a lot of the concerns that I and many of our colleagues have expressed. So uh, first, I'd, I'd like each of the panelists to, to, to just real briefly, if you can, touch on those concerns that are being expressed uh, by people that, that aren't always on the same page. I, I guess we'll start with you, Mr. Strickland. So I'll refer back to my statement at the opening, which is we won't let that happen, number one. What's, assur what's an assurance of that? I right. mean, it's good to say we won't let that happen. It, that's that's so, nice to hear it, but, but nobody knows what's going to happen. You can't tell me what's going to happen. Well, but How do you know you won't let it happen? I'm saying that we will not accept a proposal that has that as its outcome. Period. End of story. So it won't happen. Secondly, no one has yet explained to me the mechanism by which any of these individual governments could somehow seize control over the Internet as a whole. You really don't explain think that Russia, me? look, Russia and China have made it very clear what they want to do to suppress Internet freedom. They made and, it very and clear. And they do it within their own country. And, and you and don't think that they're going to be working, it. whatever rules you come up with. At the end of the day, y'all would come up with some sort of process if you're going to transfer away. And, uh, and I say if capital I, capital F, if you transfer it away, because you will come up with some sort of process. Do you really not think that Vladimir Putin, with all the other things he's busy with right now, isn't going to try to figure out some way uh, to, to get control, won't be through the Russian government directly necessarily, uh, but China and Russia prove, proven very resourceful at trying to figure out what that process is so that they can manipulate it. Now, you can do all the things you want to stop that from happening, but if at the end of the day it, it comes out to where those countries have figured out a way, like they've figured out a lot of other ways, too, uh, to do something subversive that goes against all of the intentions that we have. You can't stop that. Well, Congressman, what is it do you think they could do that they can't do What today? do you really think? That, look at what Putin's doing right now. I know the president just doesn't seem to take this seriously, what he's doing uh, through, through Eastern Europe. I mean, he's trying to rebuild, get the old band back together, get the Soviet Union back together right now. Before our very eye, I mean, Secretary of State Kerry says, oh, the international community won't accept this. They're doing it. They don't care about what the international community thinks. Uh, they're, they're talking about invade. They're invading a country. Uh, you know, so, I mean, what would they do to get control of the Internet if you threw something out there? Uh, again, I mean, these are real concerns that are being expressed. Uh, if, if the other two panelists can touch on this as well. Thank you, Congressman. Um, let me be clear that at ICANN, it is impossible for them today to do so. They've been trying for exactly, 15 years. Exactly, which is, which is why, they have why it's not, working. But, but it's not because the U.S. actually has the current stewardship role. It's because of the multi-stakeholder model. It right. stops them. Now, where they will try to do what you're suggesting is in the international intergovernmental organizations. Yeah. They've been trying to do that there. 
So we want to take away from them any argument that they still go to the UN and try to take over what ICANN does by making sure ICANN is free of one government control to show them that ICANN believes in the multi-stakeholder model and this great country that created that model trusts it. Thanks. And Mr. Gross, real quick, because I, I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, administrations right now getting ready to participate in the 2014 Internet Governance Forum in Istanbul, Turkey, a country that, that as we speak, is blocking its citizens from access to Twitter. Uh, why are we even participating in a sham like this? Well, I think it's important to recognize that the Internet Governance Forum is a non-decision-making, multi-stakeholder process. It has no authority to do anything. Why would we it's validate? A, why would we validate the things that they're doing that I would hope the administration is opposed to by, by attending that conference? I, I, I would take a different approach. I would recommend taking a different approach. Is that those who believe in the free flow of information ought to attend and speak loudly about the importance of free flow of information. It is the people of Turkey, among other places, that need to hear it and feel supported, not ignored. So it seems to me it's an opportunity for us to be strong in our beliefs there and not shy away from it. Well, I'd appreciate if you all look at the legislation that uh, Mr. Shimkus is bringing forward because I think it does uh, go back to putting those protections in place that we all ought to be concerned about uh, with people that don't have good intentions, that we'll try to figure out how to get around this. So I thank you. Thank the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have time. The gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. And, and Secretary Strickland, thanks for working on Spectrum. So together, I appreciate that. And I, I just wrote this down, uh, Mr. Shadi. You, you just said this. You said that uh, they tried to work through international organizations. I know this isn't really on the subject I wanted to go, but I know when um, – Mr. Shimkus asked about whether Ukraine was going to be RU versus dot RU versus dot whatever Ukraine Ukraine. You said that's up to the, you follow the UN on that. So was there a little inconsistency there? I'm going to just have a question and real quick because I really want to get no, to my country codes. Uh, in many ways, are set by uh, standards ISO standards that come out. So so that we don't make up countries, we follow the country code model that. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Scalise quoted Bill Clinton, said President Clinton. I'm sorry and. Uh, Heritage Foundation, um, Ms. Eshu, my friend from California, kind of said the issue over here, and she didn't really quite, um, she put it over here on us, was that our concern was the countries could take over, countries we don't want taking over the Internet, take over use of the Internet. And I understand Secretary Strickland said it can't happen, and, and really not a mechanism for that to happen, um, will not happen, will not accept it. And... So kind of the concern, I know that you had a great uh, presentation, Mr. Shadi, on American values, American exceptionalism, as I would say it. And so when we go into these negotiations, we always want everybody to have, you said, we want to do this because America, this is what America does. We create multi, but not every other country does that. And so I get to my question, you said there's really no mechanism, Mr. Strickland, for, for that to, to happen. You, you say we won't accept, so make it kind of what Mr. Shimka's asked, but in this way, you said we won't accept any plan for Mr. Shadi or any group that's not accountable and transparent. So what parameters or what would you be looking for in terms of accountability and transparency? And I think Mr. Gross kind of answered that saying, well, we don't really know what it is because they haven't developed it yet. But we need to go in at least knowing what we know and knowing what we're looking for. And what would you be looking for in an accountable and transparent program? We need to see, and, and again, ICANN has made great strides in this over the last several years. Um, the, the fact that the multi-stakeholder community feels that um, the decisions that they're making, the policies that they're developing, are being executed as they have directed them. Um, and so we look to how ICANN actually performs in that respect. We look at what the mechanisms are that are in place to ensure that ICANN performs in that fashion. Um, and again, this has been the subject of two accountability and transparency review teams that I have personally participated on in 2010 and 2013. Um, and we will continue to uh, push for those sorts of improvements throughout the next um, period of time while this plan's being put together and beyond. Because as I said earlier, uh, the organization can always find ways to improve in that regard. But when you look for something transparent, there's some specific going in that you're, I want to see that they're able to allow us to have annual public audits. They, or, or what, or Mr. Hadi, what would you offer up is these are going to show that my, the ICANN organization that you chair, 
would be transparent in a way that's a solid plan to know what not only that it can't happen now, but the concerns what happens when we're all gone. You know, 20 years. You know, the, to get to Mr. Uh, Shimkus's model, the I think Mr. Yeltsin signed the Budapest Memorandum, where Putin didn't get the memorandum. And, and so how do we kind of ensure this going further? And, and those, those are the kind of the concerns we have, and they're real concerns. Yeah, and they're real concerns, and they're ones we take seriously. Mm -hmm. I, I want to assure you of that. We do not belittle the possibility of us uh, going into the wrong mode. So we have to be alert. We have to be vigilant. We need all these companies that supported this move to remain engaged, because they have been for 15 years, and to watch what we do. <laughs> From my side, operationally, I need to make sure that every part of this process is open, is transparent, is inclusive, that we don't simply do it uh, in a suburb uh, hiding in a room and people around the world can't see what's happening. They need to participate. We have remote participation at these meetings, multiple translation, uh, meaning inclusivity, openness, and transparency have to underpin this process or it's not legitimate to this government or to anybody in the world. And that's our commitment. And I just say that I got my last 20 seconds. So when we're, when we're speaking, and speaking for on our, from our role in the government, we do know that we are exceptional and Americans expect freedom and, the, and, and opportunity and, and things that are forward. And we also know that other governments don't have that. And it's internal to their governments, they're doing it now. What we're doing now is not preventing them from doing it. We understand that, but that's what people understand. So we've got to be very careful and very transparent, very accountable if this process moves forward, so people can be confident that we're gonna have the same opportunities that we have without relinquishing our American exceptionalism or our, our American ideals to other, an international body. Thanks, I just ran out of time, I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes five minutes, the gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to the distinguished panel. Um, I would like the panel to know that I've received a good deal of correspondence on this issue, and certainly those in the district I serve are uh, concerned about the situation, and uh, I want to work to the greatest extent possible to uh, allay the concerns of, of the constituents whom I represent. And the district is um, a well-educated district and certainly uh, wants uh, access uh, to the greatest extent possible across across the globe. Um, I uh, support Mr. Shimkus's legislation. Um, to you, uh, Secretary uh, Strickling, if the legislation were uh, to pass both houses of Congress and reach the President, I, I know you've indicated, sir, that uh, you're neither for it nor against it. Uh, would you, at, at the least, um, uh, not oppose it if it were to reach the President's desk? Well, Congressman, I think, as you know, administration positions on legislation are developed through a process that hasn't happened yet on this bill, so I couldn't speak to that. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, um, I, certainly, Mr. Shimkus doesn't need me to lobby for his legislation, but I do support his legislation, and, and I would hope that uh, the administration might work in a cordial fashion with Mr. Shimkus as the situation moves forward. So as, as I told the Congressman, and I'll repeat to you and to the other members, we're committed to keeping this committee advised and informed of this process as we work our way through it. Um, we expect to uh, uh, be up here on a regular basis, perhaps not with all of our friends and neighbors, uh, but we will do what we can to keep you advised and informed of the process as it moves forward. Uh, thanks, Secretary. Uh, to that end, um, uh, I, I do have a question, and perhaps you've just answered it. You are willing to advise Congress of the proposals submitted for the transition and commit, uh, I would hope, to delay action until you have briefed Congress on the consequences of accepting any of the proposals. We will keep you fully informed, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. To, to the other distinguished members of the panel, um, uh, uh, I want to reiterate uh, the concerns of, of my constituents and I would like to, to work in a fashion where we are effective to make sure that this be as open a process as possible, and obviously it is the unanimous view of members of this subcommittee, I would presume of members of the House and Senate, that we want uh, an open and transparent process, uh, recognizing that uh, freedom across the globe is essential as we move forward in this area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time.
Well, thanks very much. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. And seeing no, no other members here to ask questions, I want to thank on behalf of uh, Chairman Walden, our distinguished panel, for being here today. Appreciate it. And we'll now and panel uh, our second panel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We'll convene the second panel at this time, and uh, the chair would first like to recognize Steve Del Bianco, the executive director of Net Choice, and we appreciate you being here. And uh, the mic is yours for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. If you look back across 16 years in three different administrations, I think you'll see that our government has protected ICANN and helped it to mature. You might also see that the U.S. cannot retain that unique role forever. And you might also admit that politics today are forcing a discussion to begin on the transition. You've heard complicated concepts and acronyms all morning long. So how about a simple analogy? Think of a car and a driver. So the top level domain table, think of it as a car. It was designed and built here in the USA in 1990. And the license plate on this car reads IANA, IANA. In 1998, we asked for a designated driver on this car, and we created ICANN to fulfill that role. Then we handed the car keys to ICANN, giving them the authority to make policies while driving that car, but we monitored what they did and the care of the car. Then in 2009, we figured ICANN was mature enough to be given some independence, and we did that under the affirmation of commitments. But all along, the U.S. government retained the title to that car. The IANA car was title was kept by the US. That became leverage for us to hold ICANN accountable for the symbolic powers that uh, Secretary Strickling mentioned earlier. NTIA's announcement that you're debating today doesn't say what happens to the title for IANA. It doesn't say it at all. Uh, it's possible that the community proposal would have NTIA sign the title over to ICANN, but that's not a foregone conclusion. It might be that we sign the title over to an independent multi-stakeholder entity that could then hold ICANN accountable the way NTIA has for 16 years. Now, NTIA's principles for the transition are great as far as they go, but to hold ICANN accountable and to prevent government capture after we sign over the title, we need more than just principles. We have to ask how any proposed mechanism would respond to potential scenarios or stress tests. So back to the car and driver analogy, we can tell our teenagers about the good principles of driving carefully in the winter, but it's a stress test to have them respond to having the car spin sideways on a snow-covered road. In today's testimony, I suggested several stress tests and use case scenarios, and our task is to develop accountability mechanisms that could answer to those tests at least as effectively as the mechanism we have today, the NTIA oversight. So I mentioned stress tests in there, like what if ICANN lack the financial or technical capability to actually execute its obligations? Who would rescue the root in that case? Um, I gave richer examples in there, like example scenarios six and seven on internet censorship. Today, censorship happens at the edge of the internet, where governments can block a domestic access to a website. As you know, Turkey's blocking Twitter inside the country, even though the rest of the world can see Twitter.com. 
Com. But consider a stress test where censorship migrates from the edge of the internet to the core of the internet, which is the root table that we're talking about here that's used by the entire world. ICANN's Government Advisory Committee, or GAC you heard today, they can change their operating procedures at any time. They can change from the consensus they have today to majority voting, which is what they're used to at the United Nations. There were only 61 governments who showed up at the ICANN Singapore meeting, so 31 governments would have been enough for a majority. So let's say those governments advise ICANN that the new TLD dot corrupt, the dot corrupt top level domain, uh, must get government permission for any domain that matches the name of a government official. After all, um, top level domains already need that kind of permission for city and territory names in new top level domains. So it seems like a relatively easy matter for them to approve a brand new policy on permission. The question is what would ICANN's board do in that stress test? If the future board felt very seriously threatened by the ITU and the UN, as Ms. Rossini will warn you in a moment, then it might not have the guts to reject that kind of advice coming from governments. So how could our new mechanism resist that pressure? It should be at least as strong as the present arrangement, where a government with First Amendment in its DNA would reject censorship in the DNS. So I'll conclude by saying most of the questions you've asked today probably can't be answered today. So we have to continue the process of developing proposals, and then we can ask how each of those proposals would answer the stress tests and questions. We can design a new accountability mechanism for ICANN, possibly with independent and external safeguards. And above all, let's be realists about the risks as we head down this road, but let's begin as optimists that we can arrive safely. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony today, and the chair now recognizes for five minutes uh, Carolina Rosini, Project Director of the Internet Governance and Human Rights Program at the Open Technology Institute at the New America Foundation. Welcome. Okay. Members of the SUBI committee, sirs and madams in the audience, I'm very pleased to testify before you today. The views I share with you today are those of the Open Technology Institute at New America Foundation, but also of public knowledge. Although I speak only for OTI and PK, I'm also a member of a broader US-based coalition of public interest nonprofits brought together to advocate for internet governance systems that preserves the open, free, generative, and global internet. Organizations that have a vested interest in promoting the free flow of information online. This coalition is guided by human rights principles and evolves based on processes that are democratic, inclusive, open, transparent, and consensus based, what we often call multi stakeholder processes. We share concerns that in this transition, the internet must continue to be an open platform for the free exercise of human rights online, and we believe this move could help hinder government overreach in internet governance, which would be, have harmful implications for human rights worldwide. This is a critical step in the history of the global network of networks. Three are my main key points today. First, we welcome the Department of Commerce proposed a transfer of oversight of the key internet domain name functions to the global multi-stakeholder community, which we are part of. This represents a fulfillment of many years of U.S. promises to the private sector, technical experts, and international community at large. We have, we have clear that the NTIA will not accept a proposal that replaces its role with government-led or any intergovernmental organization scheme. And we commend the NTIA to not forgo its contract with ICANN if a set of four principles previously mentioned and explained is not met by the final proposal. A transition on this set of terms would be fully consistent with prior bipartisan anonymous policy by the Congress that has sought to preserve and advance the multi-stakeholder governance model under which the internet has thrived. Those resolutions were an act of U.S. leadership, and I, st I stress that, international leadership, in the advance of the Wicked uh, Conference a couple of years ago. Second, we encourage the subcommittee to view the oversight of the DNS system through the lens of human rights, freedom of expression, and the spread of democratic ideals around the globe. Yesterday's resolution 
authored by members of the SUBI committee calling for internet freedom in Turkey is a proof that we are on the same page. And today, we call for that vision to be spread and applied through all of the layers of the internet. Third, we believe that if proposed transfer do not go through, the geopolitical outcomes can be disastrous. For stalling, the transfer of the IANA functions to the global mood stakeholder community could further empower critics who favor a, government, a governance model, <clears throat> a governmental or intergovernmental model of internet governance, whether implemented through the ITU, <clears throat> excuse me, or some other government-dominated non-mode-stakeholder mode stakeholder body. In this current international context, the dot-com act may actually place into the hands of those who use the internet as an instrument of political control. My final remarks. The, the pragmatic truth is that the United Nations cannot afford, the United States cannot afford to maintain the symbolic control indefinitely. A change is going to come. The question is what change and in what form? We at the OTI and PK, supported by a broad coalition of US and international public interest nonprofits, welcome the Department of Commerce plans and we will watch closely and engage deeply in all the venues of engagement. Ensuring that the transition meets, as we all hope, standards of inclusiveness, openness, transparency and accountability. In the meantime, we welcome the subcommittee interest in this complex issue and look forward to working with its members to ensure the security, stability, stability, reliance, and freedom of the global internet. As Ambassador Gross mentioned, the world is watching. Thank you so much for your time and for your trust. Well, thank you very much for your testimony today. We appreciate it. And I'll start with my uh, f five minutes for questions. Uh, Ms. Rosini, uh, you appear to be claiming in your testimony that if the transfer does not occur, the near-term geopolitical outcome will be a transfer of functions anyway to a specialized ag agency of the United Nations subject to political control. If this is in fact the case, doesn't that inform us of the dire necessity of making sure that the process that the administration is about to undertake is a sound one and that safeguards are in place to protect against that outcome after the transition is complete? Yes, I agree with that statement. Okay. Uh, I do believe, go, though, Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. I do believe, though, that we have to understand the timing and if any actions for staling that uh, transition can cause in terms of the symbolic movement of U.S. Uh, did you want to make a comment on that, Mr. Del Bianco? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the mechanism for what Mr. Rossini is talking about would have been instructive on the previous panel, this notion that the United Nations might adopt a resolution indicating that it's got an agency that should take over. In today's world, since we do hold the title, we do hold control of the root, any attempt to do that is a non-starter in today's world. It's the post-transition world where we no longer hold that title that the entities we charge with it have to be strong enough to resist that. So the mechanisms of takeover, I, I gave you one with respect to the governments changing the way they vote within ICANN, within the institution of ICANN. Ms. Rossini has talked about threats from without, outside of ICANN. And again, both cases call for us to create stress tests that can resist that. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Del Bianco, if I could follow up with another question then to you. If the NTIA role in overseeing the IANA contract is ministerial, minor, and has no real impact on day-to-day -day operations of ICANN or the Internet, as uh, Mr. Uh, Shahadi stated, what impacts would this transition really have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To call it symbolic, it does not mean that it doesn't exist. Symbolic just means we have to ask another question about what it means. In 2010, after the affirmation of commitments was signed, the then chairman of ICANN told a group in Europe that he viewed the affirmation of commitments as a temporary document that he'd like to terminate. So frankly, it's the fact that we hold the title, the fact that NTIA's supervision is there, that keeps ICANN from leaving the affirmation of commitments, that keeps ICANN honoring the obligations they have under the affirmation. And I'm reassured when the president of ICANN today says that we'll live by the affirmation. We won't quit it because it's working well, and I agree. 
but he won't be the president of ICANN forever. There's an ebb and flow of powers and pressures in a geopolitical environment. The question is, what holds ICANN to live within the affirmation? That is a symbolic value. You could call it that. But it's quite real and has effect right now. Because the affirmation of commitments was cited by everyone in the previous panel as the real constitution that keeps ICANN truly accountable and transparent to the world. Okay, let me follow up with another question to you then. What role can the nonpartisan research entities like GAO and CRS play in this process? Mr. Chairman, a, a GAO review, similar to what I saw in the, uh, the Shimkus Blackburn bill, could explore what these four principles mean, explore what the words multi-stakeholder and open of the internet. That would be very helpful to get an exploration of fleshing out those terms as we, the community, design these processes. And the GAO might, or Congress might, also help to devise these stress tests that I delineated in my testimony. I only put eight of them in there. We may need a few more. And as the stress tests are put together, the community can then use those to figure out whether the proposals are going to work. I think Chairman Upton said he characterized these bills as something of, in terms of hitting the brakes. I would, I would characterize it differently. It would be better if GAO helped us to design a crash test for the vehicles that we have to test, as opposed to hitting the brakes on the process. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rosini, um, what role do you think that public interest and civil, uh, civil society groups such as yours play in this transition, and uh, how can you encourage a good outcome in that transition process? Uh, since many years, Mr. Um, Chairman, uh, civil society has engaged actually since the very first creation of ICANN. Members of the Berkman Center that then went on to public interest organizations helped form ICANN, helped it in, uh, inform its bylaws. So historically, we are deeply involved. We are also deeply involved uh, through committees of representation that are driven by consensus building uh, norms. And we are also informed by the bylaws when we participate on those. We can also inform decisions through participation in IGF, which is non-decision making, but it is important for us to set the rules on how we are talking about concepts and so on. And we can also engage in, in even in multilateral forums, is, uh, informing the co countries on those fora. So there are many avenues for engagement, uh, participating uh, in a more decisive decision at the end. Well, thank you very much. And my time has expired. And I now recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, it seems that a lot of my colleagues here that, that have expressed concern is that some future board of ICON 20 years from now or somewhere in the future that would be influenced by some repressive government to somehow restrict <clears throat> access to the internet. And, you know, I was reading an article here from Weekly Standard that, that really questions really how powerful ICON is. Uh, and I just want to read from the statement. It says, contrary to dark speculations by various conservative commentators, ICANN can't really facilitate internet censorship in China and Iran to please those governments. ICANN can't stop them from doing that now. Nor is there any plausible scenario in which ICANN imposes censorship on U.S. websites. Actual websites operate through 13 root servers, some still directly run by U.S. government agencies, some by U.S. universities, and some by U.S. private companies. It would be no technical challenge for them to bypass ICANN and coordinate amongst themselves. Politically, it's really unimaginable that they would all bow to Chinese pressure for censorship because ICANN told them to do so. H how do you react to a statement like that? And do you, do you I mean, if, if the root servers are controlled by mostly American governments, private companies, and universities, uh, what, what can ICANN really do to force them to somehow pr censor the Internet in the United States? What the root servers contain, Representative, is a set of the top-level domains, the .com, .net, .mil, .org, and uh, 200 brand new ones that have just come along, as well as the country code. And we're still having 800 or 1,100 more coming in the next year. Each of those new top-level domains was approved by ICANN, and the ICANN Government Advisory Committee, we call it the GAC here, uh, came up with the disapproval of a few. For instance, they said that dot .islam should not go into the root. So that means it doesn't go into the main root. It doesn't go into any of those root servers wherever they're controlled. So the top-level domains that are approved 
That responsibility lies with ICANN, and then ICANN hands it over and puts it in the root. And as I mentioned earlier, that root, the U.S. government has custody of that through IANA, and that is what we're transitioning to some other body. So it, the censorship that we're speaking of is whether labels, like the top-level domain of uh, a government official's name, dot corrupt, would still be allowed to exist. And there are pernicious ways in which to achieve that. One can attach rules, and I mentioned in my testimony that the ICANN makes the rules. And today, you cannot light up Washington dot any top-level domain without the permission of that city, that country, or that territory name. So those are the kind of rules that allow governments to expand their control of the labels that are used for websites. And I know they do so in their own countries today. The question is, how do we prevent that, and we can, we can prevent that from sneaking its way into controlling the root at the top level? But, but, but there's no way that, that ICON has no power to force any of these root servers to do what it says. I mean, they could easily just bypass ICON and coordinate amongst themselves. Is that not true? That, that's an interesting proposal. That might be one of the proposals that comes back. The root server operators are an independent group of technology companies. Right. They may well <coughs> suggest a proposal for they taking <laughs> title to the root as opposed to giving it to ICANN. We'll wait and see. But the questions you ask are the hypotheticals that might be answered by a proposal. And I think those hypothetical pr questions are exactly what we need in terms of stress tests. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me ask another. Mr. Shimkus's legislation, I, I don't know whether the panelists have been provided a copy of Mr. Shimkus's uh, legislation to, to read it, but one of the concerns I have, I have no problems with the GAO doing a study. I do have a problem with the fact that it delays the process for a year, uh, or, or it could delay the process for up to a year, uh, is, is written. And what impact do you think that would have uh, if this process could be delayed up to a year while the GAO conducts a study? Uh, Ms. Rossini. Mr. Dabianco asked me to go first. So I think that this year we see a couple of very important milestones in this process. We have the Net Mundial coming in Brazil end of this month, and we also have the Pluriplop of ITU coming later in November. So you're going to have two very important meetings in this moment where we are trying to define the principles of the internet uh, uh, governance ecosystem. And if that... Uh, announcement, if that symbolic announcement that actually has a lot of geopolitical weight into it is not made clear and is not a real commitment of U.S., we can have a very uh, difficult outcome, some very difficult outcomes from these meetings. The ITU meeting coming out, you're going to have them, the voices of those governments that are non-democratic governments, uh, that can speak much loud than they would be able to speak here or even in Etmunjau, which we will be a multi-stakeholder government. And we, as civil society, we have a range of actors acting from protests in the street to media strategy to uh, uh, expert advisory. I am part, actually, of the Global Commission on Internet Governance that was announced in the UF. So we have a lot of ways to engage to be sure that the results of those meetings are well are, are, are well received and also in agreement with the open internet. So the announcement, we need your help to make those meetings work for our open internet. So. I see my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman, chair, gentleman yields back and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate following my friend from Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Jihadi had said in his testimony, in his written testimony, that in his testimony he mentioned that the importance of not rushing this process. That's his testimony. So um, I think it's important for us to get it right, and I think we've got to have comfort with this. I mean, we, um, we're, we, I understand the international push, but we've done numerous things in this government, rushing, and then, and then being embarrassed by the results of rushing through the process. So um, Government Accountability Office, as I said, is the Inspector General for us. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really the, the least, you know, we, we should at least do is have another pair of eyes on this process, answering a lot of the questions that Mr. Del Bianco had, had mentioned. Ms. Rosini, thank you for coming. Um, the first two questions are kind of part of your written testimony. In your testimony, you say that my bill, the .com Act, seeks to block the transition in the name of human rights. Can you cite the part of the bill that says that? Can you repeat the part? 
Yeah, in your written testimony, um, you say that the dot com act seeks to block the transition in the name of human rights. You 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 say yes. that this is this bill is really an anti human rights bill. I think. No, that well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Representative, first for reading my uh, complete written testimony, and uh, I think that's not my understanding of what, of what, I, what, of what I have written there. Uh, my concern is that if we if we wait one year, if we block the transition now and wait one year until we have a report, that is the risk, and that's the risk that we're gonna have for non-democratic governments to actually. Uh, uh, make their vo voices even louder and manipulate the narrative, both in Atmunjau and in the Pluripot in November. But, uh, and if I may, because I've got another question I want to follow up, so I appreciate that, because that was kind of maybe a, an answer I was expecting from the first panel. But in essence, they didn't give me that. Yeah. They basically said, we support, you know, we support another look. Transparency, good review, um, Fortunately for us, I think they, they in essence, endorsed the bill and because um, they could have responded a, a different way. And which, one thing I would – I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, one thing that I actually would add to that is that if U.S. has supported through bipartisan, unanimous consensus – the resolutions that foster mood stakeholder, this statement, this report could come as one stakeholder input, not to hold the process back. So uh, you're going to have a voice. U.S. has a strong But voice. you understand that doing a, a review by an, uh, the, uh, the Government Accountability Office would take some time. If we believe, you heard the concerns out here, and I think some of them are, I mean, as the Internet has changed over the decades, so has the world community. I think the people would credibly argue that the world is a more dangerous place today, not a safer place today. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, uh, these aren't crazy things to ask and, and review. Let me turn to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bianco to, um, to uh, address that concern and the concern about uh, another government look. Congressman, the members of NetChoice are concerned that they, we send the wrong signal by simply hitting the brakes or having a delay. And yet, we think you're sending the right signal by asking questions about defining the terms in the four principles. What does the term mean, multi-stakeholder, meeting the needs and expectations? What does openness mean? More importantly, what are the risks to those four principles and the risk of government influence associated with new proposals? So that is exactly how I believe we can channel the kind of energy that you and Congresswoman Blackburn have brought here, channel that energy into having GAO begin now at articulating what they think definitions that are appropriate for accountability and the risks, because that will allow us in the community who are designing proposals to test those proposals against the risks that Congress and the GAO have identified. Those should begin in parallel, because we started last week in Singapore to design multiple proposals, and you wouldn't believe the email traffic that's already gone on since since we left Singapore, thousands of email messages with different groups, not all I can, different groups coming up with proposals. And over 18 months, plus potentially two two-year extensions, we'll have the opportunity to narrow that down to a short list of proposals. I would benefit from having your work, the work of GAO, or anybody in the US government at articulating the risks we want to avoid. And um, I, I would just end, uh, Joe Barton stole my, the phrase I was going to use, um, Ronald Reagan, trust. But verify. And all this is is a verification of what everybody says is going to happen is actually going to happen. You go back my time. Mr. Chairman, can I just add one brief thing for the record? It'll take uh, three uh, seconds. Yes, the uh, gentleman's I, recognized. Thank you. I just want to state for the record that I did not hear any of the panelists in the first panel endorse Mr. Shimkus's legislation. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, Mr. Shimkus, if I may, I would say I was hope my colleague was at the first panel, okay. and uh, they definitely did not oppose the bill. <laughs> okay, but they didn't endorse it either. Okay. Uh, that's debatable. <laughs> okay. You, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank the, on behalf of uh, Chairman Walden, uh, for your testimony today. We greatly appreciate uh, you being here and testifying before us today. And seeing no other business to come before the committee, the subcommittee this afternoon, the committee will stand adjourned. Thank you.